All right, as Jono said, yes. that uh, I'm going to talk about FPGA, FPGA basics. So we're actually going to bring it back a level from what Jack just talked about and talked about just the lowest level introduction of FPGA basics. And Dan Maroney doesn't know it, but he and I are in a competition for who can feel more awkward up here. And I'm about to win, Dan. <laughs> so just, just watch, because I'm about to win. OK, so I've got uh, 40 minutes. There are 22 slides, so it's uh, sort of fast. Um, I'm going to talk about what an FPGA is, and then I'm actually going to, because I can't resist when I'm standing up here, talking about actual design flow, because that's something that a lot of people, even if they're taught up to how to design an FPGA, they're not talk, taught about design flow. It drives me crazy because it's always starting from scratch on that. Um, also, I'm going to have time, hopefully, for general questions. Just in general, there are so many terms that you're going to hear, you've probably already heard, you're not familiar with, you're going to hear over the next week. I am happy to hear, uh, to take any of those questions at the end if we have time. So, Dan, Legos, buddy, what do you think about that? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I think the best way to look at uh, FPGAs, and Jack's already defined it as a field programmable gate array, it's sort of a idea of you have these things called gates, and gates are already kind of a deprecated term. Um, when Jack was up here, he was talking about memory and, and I.O. And, and DSP, and gates is kind of the, the, the very basic way of looking at all of this. And so what you can I, kind of imagine is an FPGA is just a big barrel of Lego blocks in which you can build to be pretty much anything you want. Now, it doesn't mean you can build it to be anything you want that will also work, right? You could take a whole thing of Lego blocks and build them to be a mile high and try to stand on top, it's not gonna work. And so that's why you have to kind of understand in the basics what FPGAs actually, how they're actually built, what makes sense with FPGAs. But in general, you can say there are millions, and there used to be, you know, just kind of hundreds of these Lego blocks on an FPGA. And in that case, it was very easy to take each one of these blocks and build it up individually. That was called schematic capture, and you could do that. Now there are millions of these Lego blocks, and so we have to kind of abstract it a little bit. And so rather than taking out your Legos one at a time, you're kind of going to come up with big designs. Um, and you're going to use hardware language or Casper, which is even more abstract, to kind of define this. But I'm still going to kind of talk down, still kind of a low level, not all the way down at the gate level, but you should understand that's what FPGAs are about, is gates. Um, the other thing is, is that they're programmable and also reprogrammable. Um, and they can be configured into larger blocks. So you're actually making functions out of it. And a lot of people talked this morning about the different functions that you can make in them. Um, the first terminology word that we're going to use is bit file. So a bit file is basically your blueprint for what the FPGA does. So the FPGA can do all kinds of different things, but basically you have a bit file that defines what it is going to do for you, right? And somebody can, else can come up to that exact same FPGA with their blueprint completely different thing that it can do now, right? And so I use the, this is again the Lego analogy, get used to it, I'm gonna just beat the heck out of that analogy over the next few minutes. Okay, so uh, Jack showed a lot of pictures on this. So there's a distinction between an FPGA itself and an FPGA board. There in the middle is an FPGA. He's right, usually it's actually covered by a heat sink. This is the picture of it without the heat sink because they like to show it. Um, and then all this other stuff is just, you know, inputs and outputs for this particular thing. Um, this is a, oh God, I forgot, this is a Zinc 702 board perhaps? Um, one of the older Xilinx boards. And so the FPGA itself is made up of interconnected blocks, which are modules, and they have very distinct defined inputs and outputs. Right, so you're going to write those inputs and outputs and decide what kind of thing it's going to use. When you put it on a board, there's a whole lot of inputs and outputs here, but you can decide on your FPGA which of those you want input and which of those you want output. You don't have to use them all. Again, one person's bit file is going to be very different from another person's bit file. Um, I think also Casper uses the terminology bit codes or something like the same, same kind of, same thing. So here's the FPGA module. So this is what you would look like. And in FPGAs, we really love making block diagrams because it's a way of showing how are things connected. And so I stole this from a Xilinx. This is just, it's one of the IP blocks. Um, you maybe, I think some people, it just came in and out, but the term axi is just a way of talking to the block, 
right? And if we, because if you make a block and you make, in fact, a whole lot of blocks and you want to talk to those blocks to have a common protocol so everybody talks in the same language, you say, okay, well, my block can, can speak Axie. So if you want to talk to my block, it's speaking the Axie language. And here's the things it can say. So this particular thing is showing not only the block diagram. So this is how it's actually built up, so how it's going to run. You can talk to it. There's your Axie. And these are the things it's going to do. And then here's some other I.O. And importantly, this is what an FPGA diagram, no matter how big it is or small it is, is going to look like. It's got inputs and outputs. That's a definite. That's always the true for FPGA, right? That's different than a processor because this is you have to define the inputs and outputs because they're always different. And then on the inside, what is it going to do and how do those blocks? And then you're going to have this, this particular block and it's going to be put into another diagram with lots more blocks. And that's kind of the way an FPGA always works. Now, where are the gates? Well, the gates, if you take one of these things and you look deep enough, you'll actually get down to the gates. But we never really get down that far anymore. As I said, it's, there's too many millions of them at this point. So what's the difference between that and a processor or a GPU or an ASIC? You've probably heard those terms. Maybe you've never actually used them. So the CPU is like a processor. It runs any program. It's broken down into a series of operations. And it can run anything. That's, that's what a processor does. Um, a GPU is just more processors, but they're specifically programmed for parallelizing and, and a certain kind of speed. Um, an ASIC is actually a lot like an FPGA. So it's an application-specific, and I didn't finish this, integrated circuit. And so this is it's like an FPGA, except for all of your Legos are already in one form, and you can't break them down again. Right? You have one, you, you know, it's still made up of Legos, just like the FPGA is, but you can't change it. Right? It has to be in that way because that's how you, you programmed it. So you can only program it once. You can't program it again. Um, the only reason you would use these, or actually I should say one of the reasons you would use this is because they actually get cheap if you make a ton of them. FPGAs can actually be very expensive, as people who are probably in this room know. You know they can cost you know, tens of thousands of dollars, whereas an ASIC, if you build enough of them, you know, they're, they're pennies each. But it can only do one thing. Okay, so when would you use an FPGA instead of a CPU? The big thing that an FPGA could do this, this, that to me is, is the, one, the reason that I use it more often than anything else is because the CPU kind of get, if you were considering, okay, so each one of those little dots going through the big dot, each one of those little dots is something that you want it to do. A CPU at its essence, even though you, you, know, you can see it, you can think, oh, no, no, it's doing a lot of things at once. Well, not really. It's breaking down all those things and it's doing them one at a time. Right? And you can say, well, but you know, there's threading, right? And yeah, there's threading. It's still doing one thing at a time if you have one CPU. And I realize that's a, that's a major, you know, it's, it's simplifying it quite a bit. There's actually very smart threading, and then there's multiple CPUs. Um, but in essence, it still can only do one thing at a time. Whereas an FPGA can do multiple things at a time, and actually at the same time, not not threading at the same time, it's actually happening at the same time. Um, oh, the other thing that you would need, so, so I, have, I have a couple of examples here. So um, an FPGA, if you wanted to add 100 items, you could actually have 100 adders, and they're all adding at the same time. So that you could have your 100 adders done in one clock cycle. Whereas you know with a processor, if you know anything about what it works, or if you know a little bit about assembly code, kind of breaking it down, is, well, it gets the, it gets the, uh, the op code to add, and it has to go out and get the data from the memory, and then it has to bring back the data from the memory, go out and get other data from the memory and bring that back, and then add it up, and then go store it back out there. And it's going to take several clock cycles for just one thing to add. In an FPGA, that's not how it works. It's going to every single clock cycle be able to add, and it can do it multi hundreds of times, whereas the processor would have to say, okay, well, I'll first add this one and go through all that, then I'll add this one and go through all that. So the FPGA is way more efficient than that. But now, say you want a subtractor or you want something else. We have to design that into the FPGA separately, where the processor can do either one, just on different clock cycles. Um, the other thing is the specific inter external components. When you have a processor, a lot of times it will come with certain, you know, uh, it'll come with Ethernet or it'll come with USB or it'll come, you know, a certain amount. Um, FPGAs, oftentimes, you have to interface to things that 
either they're not common or um, they're very complex, and an FPGA does a better job with that. So here's the idea of the fast data processing. And a clock is, an, is, is, the, is kind of like the crux of what, how an FPGA works. I said everything's kind of working at once. You have all these adders working at once. Well, they're not just adding all the time everybody doing it. They're doing it on a clock cycle. So basically the way it works is every time you see the clock go up, the FPGA, everything in the FPGA is doing something, right? And so in this case, if you have an adder, every single time the clock goes up, it's adding. And this right here is what a lot of people cannot get about FPGAs, and that is they, oh my gosh, you made a mistake, it should, you know, you didn't, you didn't calculate it right, right? Well, that's not how it works with FPGAs. It adds it, and then, it's, then the answer is available the next clock cycle. And then while this answer is available in the next clock cycle, it's adding the next two. So it's doing it every clock cycle, but you're not getting it until the next clock cycle because it adds it on the first one, you give the result on the second one. And so we were actually talking at lunch, um, a, a few of us, about, uh, about having to learn FPGA coding, which is a specific kind of coding. It's hardware design coding instead of software design coding. And the big, with all languages, there's always a paradigm you kind of have to overcome. If you know an object-oriented language, you know that it was way different than, you know, you, you learn C or, you know, maybe you learn Python or some, you know, a basic kind of scripting Python. And all of a sudden somebody said, okay, let's use object-oriented. And you had to learn kind of a whole new way of looking at it. Even though they have for loops and they have if statements, there's a whole new way of looking at object-oriented. And hardware design language is no different. You're going to look at it. I'm going to show you a little sample of it. You're going to be like, hey, I, I can read that. That's, that's just language, right? But you still have to get over the paradigm that this is how it works, that it's working on clocks and everything is happening at once. You're not really thinking sequentially, like first I do this and then I do this. You have to think, no, every single clock, something is happening and that's how I have to think about designing. You're not going to, by the way, get this in, in you know, the 20 minutes I'm going to be up or 40 minutes I'm going to be up here, but it's something that you just have to be very easy with yourself as you're learning this. So the one thing that an FPGA can do is actually make a processor, but it's making a specific kind of processor. So in this case, maybe you are trying to make a, something that's going to um, deal with a, a stoplight. And so you say, well, I do want it to do some things. I don't want it to just add every single cycle. What I want to do is say, well, add this cycle and then think of, you know, and then decide if, if it's high enough the next cycle and then throw it away the next cycle. And that's what a state machine will do for you. So a state machine is actually kind of making a processor. In this case, it's processing the input of a stoplight. And, it may, and, and so it is, it is actually doing kind of a processor function. And in fact, I should, I should say that you can make a processor with an FPGA, and in fact, um, not only can you, but there's special IP or uh, intellectual property, <laughs> intellectual property um, on the Xilinx tools that will give you a processor. It's kind of like having your big box of Legos, and somebody's already built you a helicopter in there, right? That's what a process. That's what you can do with FPGAs; is they can already have this built up for you. Um, the other thing is, is that if you have a special component interface, so in this case, this is a temperature monitor, and it says, well, and this is actually a common interface as well. I think this is, this is a, an SPI. So there's all kinds of different interfaces that you can use. This is an SPI interface. And so my FPGA it has to be able to read these temperatures. And so the spec for this particular temperature says, here's how we're going to give you data. Right? The reason that you need to kind of understand the way hardware works, the way FPGAs work, is to read this spec, you have to understand what does this even mean. Now we talked a little bit about this. You see the clock, right? It's called SCK. But you can see that there's always going to, well, not always, but mostly there's going to be one of those. And so you can kind of say, okay, on the rising edge, or in this case on the falling edge, what's happening every single time? And it's saying, well, the first rising edge I'm going to give you a zero, and then I'm going to start giving you data. And so in FPGA, you can design it so that you can read this, right? A computer it, or a processor, it could do it if it has an SPI interface. You still have to write a driver that kind of reads in a certain way. 
The FPGA is very specific about that. You can write something specifically for this. Um, so now we're going to get to FPGA design flow, and this is where I just want to talk about this and give you an overview. So if you're ever interested in actually doing real FPGA work, you follow these all of these steps, right? And so that's something that um, Casper actually does a really good job of kind of, you know, trying to pull back and not force you to do everything here, or at least make it easier, kind of make, make, this, a, make this a flow that's kind of natural. But I'm going to walk through them anyway so you can see exactly what you do have to go through. So these is, or what I believe, I shouldn't say I believe, I didn't make these up. These are what the FPGA design flow is supposed to be in order to actually get the best code out. Um, first is coming up with requirements. Almost everybody skips that. You just jump right into it and go, oh, I kind of know what I want to design. Requirements, you'll never know if you're done until you write down the requirements. Because that way you can say to yourself, okay, did I do my checklist of things? Then I am done. A lot of people hate saying I'm done, so that doesn't work for them. Um, Actually, would you mind breaking down what the requirements are? On requirements? Yeah. Um, so requirements is what is the thing? What does the thing have to do? So, in this case, uh, if you're going to do a stoplight, it has to read a stoplight. It has to be able to make sure that it goes through a specific sequence without killing everybody. For instance, it's not going to go all of a sudden from green to red or from I don't know uh, green. Actually, no, it can't do that, can it? <laughs> bad, bad example. So requirements are just some things that you get together with whoever wants to use your system and say, what do you want the system to do? I mean, that's just a basic. What do you want the system to do? So, the big thing about requirements, yeah? Yeah, so, so um, warn the driver that red is coming by shining orange for two seconds. Oh, you're getting it. Yeah. You already have it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, but that's, no, but that's exactly right, right? You're right. You're putting down each of these requirements. The, big thing for, the biggest thing for requirement is not only to tell you when you're done, but to tell you how to test the thing, right? If somebody says this is a requirement, then you know you have to test that particular thing. So, and you know when it's actually working. So that everybody who uses it, you can say it can do these things. Um, the architecture and specification is the general idea of how it's going to do it. So the first thing, what is it going to do now? How is it going to do this? This is typically something that does require somebody who's had a lot of experience because breaking these things down into modules is actually quite a difficult thing to do. Um, then you get to code, and I shouldn't have said code here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that when, when you don't use code. Um, and then simulation, which I'm going to harp on in such a way you guys are going to wish I'd leave. And um, synthesis, place and route, bit file. So these, synthesis, place and route, bit file, this is, you've told it how to do it, you've given it the blueprint. This is, it's taking out the Legos and figuring out which ones are the best to use and how to put them together. Normally, we used to do this ourselves. You can't do that with millions of gates. So now you have a tool that does it for you. When you press a button in the end saying synthesize place and route, it's sitting there. That's what it's doing, figuring out which gates it should be using and how it should be putting it together and how it should be laying it out. Um, and then that makes the bit file. And the bit file, once again, is what the, FP, the function of the FPGA. And then you go to lab. Um, so yes, this is the requirements. I talked a little bit about it. What does this need to do and how will we know when we're done? Those are the biggest things to answer. And it is going to tell you how you should design it, what should testing look like, and also if you're the kind of person to do this, how long is it going to take? Requirements can tell you how long it's going to take and how many people you need to do it. And there's the architecture. We're back with our friend, the I squared C bus. Um, How's, how do we break this down into modules? So each one of these is a module. How do we best break this down? This was this designer's way of doing it. If you had come up with the same requirements, if somebody had given you the same requirements, you may have had a completely different breakdown, right? But this is this designer's way that it makes the most sense. You break it down and you can say, OK, I'm just going to code this. You can actually hand it out to people. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna have you code this, I'll code this, and then we're gonna have somebody else code this, and then we're gonna put them all together. The important thing if you do this, inputs and outputs. 
if this person needs to deal with this person, you would better define what this is going to look like. That's the most important part about FPGA, inputs and outputs. Harp on that one a lot. Um, also, software interface. So how will you configure your FPGA? You can certainly say, well, this FPGA is going to run this one way. Or you can make your life easier and make some cer certain things configurable. Okay, so code. So there's levels of abstraction with code. Remember I talked about schematic capture. We don't use that anymore, not very much. I haven't met anybody who, who even knows how to do it in a long time. Um, hardware design language. So that's what I've been talking about, the VHDL, which is one hardware design language. System Verilog, which is a, or, sorry, Verilog, which is another hardware design language. System Verilog, I'm kind of giving, getting ahead of myself now, and I'm not going to go into that. Um, there's also something called HLS. And if you are listening to some conversations around, a lot of people are talking about HLS. It's a horrible acronym. What it's basically doing is saying, okay, VHDL and Verilog, not a lot of people know. They're hard, okay? But a lot of people know C. So we're going to have some people who know C, and we'll translate it into the hardware design language and down into the gates. It's, it's, it's a little bit controversial. It can get into religion. You don't want to bring up a huge opinion on it without knowing who you're talking to. <laughs> um, and then there's Xilinx IP. Xil I shouldn't say Xilinx IP. A lot, of, a lot of different manufacturers have their own IP. And once again, intellectual property. So they have designed, I use the Lego thing, they've designed a helicopter in there for you, right? They've already designed it. You don't have to design it yourself. Now, it, it means that you're not going to get the exact one you want, but they're usually pretty good about making it very configurable, and it saves you a lot of time. Um, so using that, Casper, same concept. They're making, they've made it very configurable. They're trying to save you some time. Yeah, you could design it yourself. You could go down and start from scratch. Then you would get the exact thing you wanted, and it would be exactly efficient. But do you want to waste your time doing that when other people have done it for you? It's a question you have to ask yourself when you're architecting it. Um, and then so I have some examples here. of Oh, those are the schematic captures. So that's down to the actual gates. But notice inputs and outputs still back, back then. Here is VHDL. Oh, it does look bad when you open it up like this. Here's VHDL, but if you look at the top there, see those words in and out? Same thing. You always have to define your inputs and outputs. It's the most important part. And then this is what it's going to do on the inside. And if you look kind of closely, you can say, oh, wait, okay, I can recognize. Even if you don't know anything, okay, I recognize it's got if statements. Everything else does. Just you got to get around the paradigm. But other than that, it's, it's the same stuff you've seen. Um, okay, so I just want to just make this really strong point in that, and, and the reason I'm making this point is because I came from a software background. I went to work for some people who said, hey, you know, we're, we're doing some FPGA work. Do you want to do that? I looked at some FPGA code. Uh, there it is. I thought, well, this isn't that hard. I, I totally recognize that. This is the guy, if statements, I can do this. And I wrote a bunch of code, and my boss said, this is the worst stuff I've ever seen in my life. Clearly, you know nothing about hardware design. And I did not, right? And if you look at, if you just, all you're trying to do is add a few things, you could look at it and see. You could look at VHDL, and you can kind of say, okay, I can sort of see how this is working. But look at the inputs and outputs and what comes in and what comes out. They're nothing alike. And if you don't understand that, then you're not going to be a very good designer. Now, I don't expect you to understand that now. And in fact, I'm not explaining it right now. It's actually kind of complex, and we have to draw out the more clock diagrams and discuss it and things like that. The point is, is that you just have to overcome this certain paradigm, and then you can completely design in, in hardware. And I wouldn't be scared of it. It actually okay. doesn't take that long. Is that just what you showed us earlier, that there's a, there's a time lag? Yeah, well, not just that there's a clock slip. Not just that there's a time log. That's one of the things. That's one of the things you're seeing, right? Because right? I have X's here. The other thing is that both temp and out are being updated at the same time. So it's not you're not doing temp first and then out. You're doing temp and out at the same time. The steps in this program are not... They're not sequential. That's not how it works. Yeah, that's not how it works. It executes every line of the program simultaneously. Yes. That's what it does. Whereas this does not. This is you can this you can read from top to bottom. You cannot read this from top to bottom, or you can, but it, it, it's not the way it's going to come out. So it's going to come out in a very different way. 
But it actually does make sense when she started laying it out with clocks. And in fact, in order to do that and put it out, but thing I had to draw myself a whole, you know, clock diagram. Otherwise, you can't do it. Whereas you can kind of do it in your head over here. Actually, probably some people could do it in their head. I'm just not one of them. Okay, so again, IP, and I can't stress this enough. You want to, when you start the project, say, what? How can I be as lazy as possible? There's this thing, uh, NASA does this, uh, does this thing in which they, they figured out that the, the, the best people to work for them are people who are smart but lazy because they're, they're, the, they're usually the most efficient because they're always trying to figure out what's already been done and uh, instead of reinventing it every time. So I can't stress enough that figure out where you can actually you know, cut corners, whereas you don't have to design it yourself. Maybe it's not going to be exactly what you want, but it's close enough and it'll release you to work on more interesting things, things that people haven't already solved. Um, the big thing here is, uh, you see how I read the specification, also write the specification. That's part, that's kind of step two after the requirements is you write a specification so other people can use your stuff. But this right here, Xilinx will have a whole, you know, usually if it's Xilinx, you know, 2,000 pages on how to use this thing. And 200 of them will be very useful. But it won't be signed, it won't be contiguous. And <laughs> there's like three people laughing because they like actually know Xilinx. Um, all right, so this is the biggest, biggest, biggest point that I really want everybody to get here about FPGA design. So you don't have to just go, okay, I've, I've written my code, now I'm gonna push the button. Oh great, now I have a bit file, I'm going to the lab. It's the last thing you should do. First thing you should do is simulate. And simulation is basically the way that you know when you walk into the lab, it's just going to work. I've impressed a lot of people who think I'm just really, really good at, at coding. I'm actually horrible at coding. I make all kinds of mistakes, but I simulate the heck out of it. So when I walk into the lab, it just works. Now, if it doesn't work, it means my simulation wasn't good enough. So simulation is... You basically, the reason you can't do it in the lab is because you get there and you press it and you're like, well, okay, so I'm not getting any data out, right? And that's all you got. So you, you know, you get out your scope and, no, that's not, oh, okay, well, why is that happening? So when you simulate, you actually know exactly what's happening. You can completely control the inputs, you can completely control the outputs, and you know what's going on inside the chip because it has all that information for you in the tools. It tells you exactly what's going on. It's very important to simulate. So what you need to do is basically, you have to write some control, something that's going to give your, your device under test, or that's, the, that's your design, some input. Then you have something that can check the output, and then you look at it and see if it works. Now, I've designed whole courses around this. Another thing, you know, it's one slide, but it's really, really important, really important. Come and talk to me about it. I'll just keep talking about it. Um, it's really important to get this down. Believe me, you will spend one one hundredth of the time simulating than you do trying to figure something out in the lab. If something goes wrong, you can simulate it. You can come up with it. You can debug it so much more quickly than you can in the lab. And it's always nice to be able to go to the lab and have it work right out. It, it'll save you just tons of time. Um, I actually have talked a little bit about kind of more advanced stuff. I don't think Casper does any of the, the more advanced stuff. Um, but this, this is really advanced stuff, is in when we do things like go into space and it has to work because you're not going to go up there and, and fix it. Um, we, can, we do really, really advanced simulation where we just beat, beat on the thing for weeks and weeks and weeks. Again, not in the lab, but in simulation um, because you can get more done. Okay, so remember I said you have tons and tons of Legos there. They all need to be put together in a certain configuration. That's what synthesis and place and route do. So synthesis is actually taking your code or your Casper block or whatever you have and deciding what gates to use. So do you need multipliers? What kind of, you know, or is it DSP blocks you need? What, what exact gates do you need? So it picks, it up, picks them out for you. Um, place and route decides where they're going to go on the chip, right? They're all over the chip. Where can it best go? Because routing is, okay, you have this block here and this block here. How's it going to get in between these two blocks? Now, remember, we talked about the clocks, right? Every time it goes, every time the clocks go up, something else is going to happen. Well, that means that everything has to happen and all the signals need to get to the other part of the chip between those two clocks. And so that's what the tool is doing. 
Can you do it? Yes, if you had infinite time. It just takes a long time. Even a, even a, um, a Xilinx tool, which is cranking out incredibly quickly, can take hours to come up with a place and route. In the end, it'll give you reports. Some of it will say, yeah, well, I did it, but it's not a good design. And, I mean, Xilinx will tell you that. It'll say, well, look, it's supposed to get from this side to this side in this clock. And it's actually taking this amount of clock. So you have to think, you have to come up with a way to redesign that because it's not going to, it's not going to, it's not going to do what you think it's going to do if it doesn't meet it within a certain clock. Um, the other thing is it'll tell you how much of the chip you're using, which is actually very important, utilization, and it'll tell you, um, did you do something wrong in your code? Because it'll, it'll actually program it for you even if you made a stupid design, it'll just warn you about it. Also warn you about seven hundred things that you don't have to care about. <laughs> seven hundred is that all you get? <laughs> oh, it's all the things that don't matter. It is absolutely true. It'll tell you when you didn't use a particular signal that you never wanted to use in the first place. And there's no way to say no, no, no. It's just I mean you can ignore it, but oh my gosh, it's so much work. So yeah, your eyes start to glaze over. I actually have a friend who made a better tool. That, that kind of parses through it correctly, and, and, I, and I like it better. Um, so yeah, generating the bit file. So now you've created the blueprint. How's the FPGA supposed to work? You upload the bit file in what's called configuration memory. So that's actually where the FPGA stores how it's supposed to work. And then you're ready to go. Again, you end up with a bit file. You go into the lab with your bit file. Casper has an easy way of getting it onto the chip. There's multiple ways of getting onto the chip. The Casper is an easy way, so you don't have to think about it. That's a good place not to be thinking. Um, and then you can start running. Um, somebody said earlier, I don't know who it was, Jack probably, about blinky lights. You know, you, immediately your lights just start blinking. Well, what if you don't program blinky lights? Then go back and program blinky lights. It's one of the most important things you can program. Otherwise, you just, it's, it's depressing when like, you don't even know if there's blinking. You don't even know if your clocks are working. Um, so, oh, I got a minute. Um, okay, so selecting an FPGA. Um, again, Jack talked a little bit about this. You, it's, it's all about resources, right? Every FPGA has a different amount of Legos and a different selection of Legos. You got to read it. Memory, um, the mini modules. So this is kind of the new gates. Is uh, is is something called LUTs? What kind of I/O you have? Um, I'm sort of in a hurry, so I'm just going to keep going. Actually, I have five minutes. Do I? How do I have five minutes? Well, you started five minutes late. Oh, it's okay. We all the time. I'll try to. I'll try to. You can, we can do a Q and A if you want to finish quickly. Okay, I'm about to finish quickly. Okay, so um, so here's a few problems and, and some solutions for it. One is it doesn't work in the lab. You bring it to the lab and you look down and oh my gosh, nothing's working. It means you didn't simulate right. Go back and make your simulations better. What did I tell you? Simulate. Um, but also check the clocks. If I could tell you how many times it was a clock problem, I would have like five dollars. No, but seriously, it, it's, it's, it's always, it's always the clocks. For me, it's always been the clocks. It's, it's a painful thing. It's why I have a blinking LED for as part of my design, because the first thing I want to check is, are the clocks even on? If my LED's not blinking, I'm like, aha, someone screwed up the clocks. Um, so that's, that's just something that, you know, it's like, I, I, you know, I've, I've made the mistake a hundred times. <laughs> I've now gotten used to it, so I always make uh, blinking LEDs. And the other thing is timing won't close. So you make this brilliant design, you're very happy about it, and Xilinx says, oh, you are outside of timing, and it's a helpful red signal. Um, the big thing is, you know, this is actually getting into way, way too many details. Way too many details, so I'm not going to go into that. I can, as I said, any one of these, you know, Jonathan said, hey, can you give an FPGA talk? And it's kind of like saying, hey, can you talk about people? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Except for I really couldn't talk about people. <laughs> so, um, okay, so does anybody have any questions? Yeah. So, so, so there is. I know, uh, there's like two minutes left. No, 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 there's a good four minutes. Um, well, not if we keep to the schedule, Jonah. Um, Schedule, schedule. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we said this morning. So, so we all, we all, no, 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 I, I think it's been excellent today. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy with uh, keeping of time. Um, we will have a full 20 minutes of coffee. Never you fear. Go five minutes over the, the, the closing today. Oh, sorry, yes. Why don't, why don't you just shoot away with the question? Could you talk a little bit more about how the FPGA actually reprograms itself? 
Okay, so if the bit, so if the bit panel is loaded and you want it to you want to reprogram it with something different or I mean, what actually happens to take the information in that file and 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 change it to be something to change it to do something completely different, um, or is that what you mean to change? Like actually change it to do something completely different? It's a, it's so it's given a, a new bit file. A, a new bit file. So the way the F, the way the FPGA works is there's actually kind of a state machine where it, it if you oh should I talk about how Casper does it or just how it works in general? It. I know. Looking at you, Jeff. Um, okay. So in general, so there's um, there's a there's a program signal that you kind of you have to you have to toggle, and it basically tells it I'm about to give you a new and, and, and with this signal it tells you I'm going about to give you a new bit file, which means that it goes into the certain internal state where it starts to accept getting a new bit file on. And so when it gets this new bit file, and it's, che and it's also checking it, it checks it, it checks some and things like that, um, and it loads it up into its memory. <coughs> Once it's done and it's accepted it, and then it's ready to go again. And so typically, so there's actually inputs and outputs on the FPGA that give you that information. Um, there's the program one that, you, that is, you're telling it, I'm programming it. It has a done signal where it says, okay, I have the new bit file now, and, and now I'm ready to run the new bit code. Um, and so if you want to do it again, different, different bit file, you, you know, toggle that program bit again, say I'm giving you another bit file and it kind of takes it all, it takes a new one back in. So it overwrites the, the old one, just kind of like right on top. You can think of it, it's called configuration memory, it actually is memory. It's just basically entering in this whole new, basically set of, you know, I wouldn't say set of instructions, but blueprint. And once it gets it all, then it, it keeps going. Did that answer your question though? I feel like you you had a bigger question than that. Oh, did somebody? Yeah, really, with maybe I'll ask her. I think her question is, okay. is how are the routing? I mean, so there's a lot of things it could do, but it doesn't do them all. It somehow must change the routing, right? So the program says that combines the different multipliers and things together. Right. Yes. Okay. So so that's so that's what the actual so that's what the tool does, right? It's reading your code and it's saying, first of all, what am I going to select? You know, what which of these gates am I going to select? And then the routing is, where are they going to be on the chip? So and there's lots of routings on the chip that could exist, but only some of them are selected. Yeah. I mean, it's, again, again, going into the Lego thing, right? You're not using all the Legos and you're not connecting them in all the ways that they could be connected. So how does the configuration memory determine the routing Okay, so now you're okay. So now you're actually talking about kind of. Oh wow, I, I have this really good picture that I don't have right now. Um, I, I guess the best way to say it is it's a kind of a set of instructions, kind of in memory. It's, it's actually really hard. That that that's actually a really technical question that would be best shown by a picture. Let me see if I can find that picture and then post it, and, because they do have a picture. Yeah. Actually, uh, Dan, I think Tracy was uh, before you, I'm and sorry. I think that's, that's to kind of be our last point. I'm sorry. So yeah. when you're creating the HDL, you are creating a digital circuit, so we can't get away from that. That's down to transistors. That's what the gates are made of. Mm -hmm. So you're definitely creating a circuit. So when the synthesis tool is just taking that circuit and placing it at the most efficient um, places where you can deal with signal integrity so that you can meet timing, just like with courage and sharing. But what I do when I'm programming my FPGA is many times I do a dummy check all the time. I'm like, okay, I'm not sure if my old design is on that FPGA, so I usually just power cycle. Have you ever gone through that where sometimes you, you're, you're, even with your new design, it still seems to not be functioning like what you expect? So, I'm always thinking, well, is my old design still on there? And if I think my old design's on there, then I just I just turn the FPJ on and off and then reload the new bit file. Right. So and, and you can so the way that I try to get around that if I'm if I'm trying is I try to put a, a readable register that tells me what version of the FPGA, which is actually something that I, I talk about more than I practice. Um, although it's a really good idea, <laughs> um, but yeah, that's but yeah, that is yeah. You can always turn it off, turn it back on, reload your your code, and and uh, and make sure that it, the right stuff's on there. Uh, okay, great. Thanks very much uh, again, Terry. Um...